he said something which I often repeat. Il n'y a pas d'affaires pressées. Il n'y a que des clients pressés. And I think this is true today. I think it can be a prestige. You call it elevated to the status of. That's the word they use in England, at least. But at the same time, it must not give us a feeling of having two bars. Unfortunately, my father, Maxim, passed away quite young. So I didn't have time with him enough to be able to fully appreciate his guidance. Patrice, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for gracing us with your presence. As I told you before we started, we don't have many lawyers on this podcast. I'm unique. <laughs> exactly. So let's start about your, your journey. I, I wanted to know, have you always wanted to be a lawyer? Not quite. Okay. Maybe I should say that uh, I was born in a legal environment being given that my grandfather, Maxim, and my father, Maxim too, Maxim Jr., both were barristers. Mm -hmm. Both, I mean, they were seasoned barristers that had been elevated to QCs, uh, cases, QC then. And uh, therefore, I was surrounded by lawyers. In fact, even if I go further back, my grand, great-grandfather was a notary. Oh, wow. And he had two sons who were notaries, therefore brothers of my grandfather. Mm -hmm. So there was a legal environment around me, and obviously law was present. Mm -hmm. However, I remember being a, a teenager, I was more interested in politics, local, European politics, mm -hmm. and uh, I thought that I was, I mean, I was planning to go to Sciences Po in Paris. But uh, at the last minute, I changed my plans, really at the last minute. And I registered at the School of Law in London. So I graduated and became a lawyer. Obviously, uh, I, I suppose that this uh, somewhere, somehow, this family environment where law was always, always present, present mm -hmm. has probably influenced me somewhere, somehow, instinctively influenced me, because obviously we always had conversation about justice, about integrity, about hard work, about not being biased, about being independent. So I think that uh, all these have intuitively motivated me to become a lawyer, but to answer the question squarely, no. <laughs> I didn't. Okay. And, and maybe I should add that I was never influenced by my father, say, please. I was going to ask that. Uh, so you were, you were never pushed into it? Never pushed into it. But I, su I suppose he was very happy yes, when I joined yes, of uh, course. his profession. And so you talked about some values, and that was going to be my next question, actually. So do you think your childhood and, and the way that you were raised influenced the type of lawyer you have become today? Most probably. But you must put yourself back in, the, in, the, in those days. First of all, my grandfather and my father were inevitably jack of all trades. Mm they had the chance of working for corporate clients, but also for individual clients. And the uh, jurisdiction was so tiny in Mauritius that they did everything. 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 Criminal law, family Criminal law, law, corporate law. And, and, and mm. so on and so forth. But they were also, uh, their services were retained by, by, by uh, mainly in those days, in those days, Mauritius was a monoculture. There were 30, 35 sugar companies, factories, and fortunately for them, many of these 
companies were, were retained their services. So, I mean, they gradually, I suppose, did more corporate law, commercial law, but initially they did everything. And in fact, myself, I started doing everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But has it, I'm sure it has evolved. So when you, you're, you're obviously a senior counsel now, when you started practicing, when you look at the profession now compared to what it was, say, 30 years ago, what are the main things that you would say has changed? Not in terms of the law, but in terms of the profession itself and the way, the way it's conducted. Uh, first of all, the number. Too many, perhaps? No, no, it's not a question of too many. It's, it's the sheer number is, mm. is so, I mean, we were less than 100 when I joined in. Wow. in the, I started practicing in the 80s. Less than 100. And now we are, as you know, over yeah. 1,000. Yeah. Barristers, not to talk about mm. the other branches of a profession. Um, so this inevitably impacts on, 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 on different uh, elements of, of a profession. The big change has been rather recent, I suppose, in terms of the organization. We were all, at my, when I started, we were all self-practitioners. Mm -hmm. Now, as you know, there are set of chambers, there are law firms. The concept of in-house lawyers Was didn't non -existent, exist. Non-existent, yeah. Non-existent. Mm -hmm. Now, most organizations, be it the public sector, the private sector, most of them, when they have a sufficient size, they have an in-house legal team. So these are a major difference, unfortunately, because uh, this helped to cope with the increasing number of professionals at the bar. Mm. I presume also the, the, the profession has changed because the world has become global. Now, we are, we, we, we've got clients from abroad, which probably was quasi non-existent before. Moreover, this globalization and with all the, the new crimes through terrorism, money laundering, and, and, and other fields have uh, forced Mauritius also to adopt new laws. Mm. And one thing that, that always, uh, I think it, it, it's very damaging to the profession is the fact that the, the first rule, principle behind a lawyer was the privilege that existed with his clients, which is or was sacrosanct. Secret, yeah. Now we, we've, this is disappearing, not only in Mauritius, mm. but in Globally. other jurisdictions mm. as well. If you look at, um, I mean, I remember very, very well when they adopted the FIAMLA and POCA in the early years of, the, of this uh, century. And we were, we were forced, in fact, we were pushed to adopt these new laws by all these uh, European organizations, mainly yeah. European organizations. And uh, I remember at a conference telling a French guy, a guy from Monaco, I don't remember quite well, saying, how can you, you haven't even adopted the same type of, of, of laws in your country and you want us to be able to denounce somebody when he comes because we suspect that he had made money launderer, that might be, had been involved somewhere, somehow in, a, in crime of terrorism. So, and I say, I'm not equipped. I'm not equipped, I've not been trained to do it, and I can't understand how can you force us. But to come back to the first subject I wanted to, 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 to underline is this was an erosion of this sacrosanct rule of privilege between yourself and the client. And also, I feel that I, I agree with you that the world in general, and not just Mauritius, has changed in a way that can be quite scary sometimes. But do you, it might come as a strange question, do you still get as excited by your job today as you did 30 years ago, despite all of the challenges? Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm extremely excited by what I, I do. This is why I'm mm. hardworking. <laughs> 
You're always at the office at 7.30 in the I'm morning. I'm always at the you? office. And uh, this is also because of the traffic. I know, <laughs> from Cupid. But, uh, not only from Cupid, everywhere. <laughs> anyway. uh, I mean, I'm going to the north this afternoon and yeah. I know it's horrible <laughs> on, on, on the motorway to go to the north. No, I, I know I'm still very excited because the more so that I work with a lot of much younger mm. barristers than, than me. And, uh, and I think it's, it's very, very enlightening to work with them, to see the way they, they react, to, to see their approach. And, and I, I suppose they learn from me, but I learn a lot from them too. What do you learn from them? I mean, uh, the freshness of their approach. <laughs> When they, they all these, let's, let's say they, they are horrified by the postponements. Obviously, my skin is thick now and I'm, I'm used to it. For the newcomer, he cannot understand the way things are, are, are being adjourned, are being postponed so easily. And in spite of the fact that we've worked a lot on it, that we are ready with the case and that we all know that in four months time or six months time, when the matter will... You have to stop you preparing You have to stop to start anew. Of course. But I've been doing it for So you're years used now. to it. And, and I guess the, the impatience of the, the I, I, like, I love to call them the Gen Z, but I, I don't think it's just Gen Z. I think it's also after. But you, you mentioned that you, so you learn a lot from them. But I think one of the things that, especially as in your capacity as senior counsel, they also see you as a kind of mentor how important do you think that is to to as a young barrister to to have someone to or shall I put the, the question differently do you think the role of mentorship in the legal profession is valued appreciated and encouraged in in Mauritius maybe the answer should be uh, the uh, yeah, the first answer is that I think it's essential to to, uh, to have mentors I have I was privileged to have quite a few in my days, the organization, as I say, were totally different. I was lucky, as I, I repeat myself, to have mentors, and I might even name some of them, people I'm sure you heard of. But, but the first mentor I, I could have had was my father. Unfortunately, my father, Maxim, passed away quite young. So I didn't have time with him enough to be able to be able to fully appreciate his guidance. However, fortunately, I had a lot of people in the profession, seniors, who have helped me, assisted me extensively. And I, I, I don't like to, to, to list them, but I mean, I can remember people like Sir Mark David. In fact, there is my father-in-law Michel Avrillon, whom I work a lot with, Rémoin, Sir Henry Garrick, obviously Sir Hamid Moulin, and many others. And uh, I even, maybe I should mention him, somebody who, I mean, uh, I was very lucky, Sir André Raffray. Sir André Raffray is somebody who was born in the 19th century. 1998, I think. And I had the privilege to be his junior on a few big cases. And uh, he worked till, till very, very late. And uh, sometimes uh, he, had a, he, had, he had this office, his chambers, now where is one Café Square, I think just behind Kentucky Fried mm -hmm. Chicken. Mm -hmm. And funnily, because they didn't work very late, mm -hmm. I think, if my memory is, is, is correct, I think he didn't have a, a light. He didn't have... A, I think, really? Yes, I don't think so. I think, so by the time you got in winter about five o'clock... <laughs> it's time to go yeah, home. Yeah, you had to, to, go, to go back. Love it. Difficult to see. Yeah. But he could spend hours uh, with me, and I remember the way he was... He was some, somebody very, very precise and meticulous, but he had time. He had a lot of time. And when he, uh, and, and he wanted, very often I re remember, he wanted to, 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 when he was going to make submission, usually it was big cases before the Supreme Court, an appeal, 
or important judicial reviews, never at first instance, he would rehearse with me almost oh. his, his submissions. And he would say, How, what do you think? How do you think? And it, uh, but he had time. And they had time in those days. Didn't have the volume of cases. They, that they didn't have the today. volume of cases. Mm. And they didn't have impatient clients. And this brings me to something else. My grandfather. I never worked with him, but obviously I knew because he, when he died, I, I, I was studying abroad. Okay. And he said something which I often repeat. Il n'y a pas d'affaires pressées. Il n'y a que des clients pressés. And I think this is true today. Mm. Because so often today, and now it's instant. Communication with is instant. email, WhatsApp, and yeah. And you, you want to, to, to have the answer on the spot. And if you don't get the answer, the client doesn't get the answer on the spot, he's angry with you. Yep. And, and he, he might even threaten to go and look elsewhere. Exactly. Well. <laughs> he's so frustrated that he goes elsewhere. But uh, sometimes, therefore, you, you work overnight to be able to do the job. And you, you give your whatever advice or, or, or you, you've written some, some documents, some, some contracts. And then, because it, it tells you it's a, tomorrow, it, it's, it's, it's a need. It, I require it. And then three weeks later, he comes back and the matter has not been solved. And he, What's well, he hasn't advice. even looked at the contract yet. No, no, most probably has looked, but I mean, there has been, there have, no, I hope not. <laughs> and I think what my grandfather used to say, apparently, and I think I heard it, I heard it once or twice, is quite true today also. And this is one of the bigger problems of modern Society. with us today. Yeah. I think it's, 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 it's a real problem because we are... Everybody thinks that we should answer them. And obviously, if you answer too quickly, you make errors. But, and, if you, and if it's written down, and then in six months' time, then they, they will take you to task. And also, it would be very difficult to say then, oh, no, but you put pressure on me to, to exactly. you know. And, and that's actually one of the things I always really appreciated with you, is that you've, you always made time that there's you know on the few occasions that we i was lucky enough to to work with you time was never an issue you've always taken the time that needs to to be taken and i've always perceived you as someone who's very thorough so is that one of the skills if i may say that you teach to your mentees to you take the time that yeah you need yeah to i take. think you must take the time I, yes probably i i i, I do tell them take the time, and if I've got a, an advice to, to tell uh, all of them, is not only take time, but, uh, but also I um, mean, try to, be, to do your best. Mm -hmm. And to do one's best, you must take time. Mm -hmm. because, and if you've done your best, and the end result is against you, so be it. I mean, you, you, you've got nothing to, to worry about. But if you are not well prepared, mm -hmm. you haven't worked hard enough, then this, this is a problem for, for, for your client, obviously, but for you, you too. And I think this is, yeah, uh, I, I appreciate what you just said. I think this is one of the uh, main quality that somebody at, in the profession should have. Be thorough. Yeah. And, and do you have, because I know you do, so you do litigation, but you also do advisory work as well. Do you have a preference, a personal preference? <laughs> if you could choose. <laughs> Litigation, your, your adrenaline mm. is intensified. It's like doing any sports. And the, I mean, I think in litigation, one thing I, I really like is cross-examination at first instance. Really? I've, and when you, when you, it's much more easy, as, as far as I'm concerned, than examination in chief. Because examination in chief, if you go ag ab about it uh, with uh, in the um, dans les règles de l'art, it's sometimes difficult to get the answer you you, you think you should uh, the witness should give, and uh, you you can't lead and so on and so forth, and then 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 the matter goes uh, it's out of your hands. Yeah. yeah. Whereas in cross examination, especially when the witness 
when the witness is not telling the truth, that's you can easy. go to town on them, <laughs> uh, and 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 you you he's going to 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 get in in the uh, the wrong corner, and then this really at the end of the day you will. You, there will be pride in, in the job you'll be doing and you'll be very happy. And the, I think cross-examination in litigation is the thing I, I like the best. But I've had the chance since the very, very beginning. As I said, my, my father also had a clientele which mm -hmm. was corporate. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I started working as a junior with him, I managed to get this kind of clientele and to, to give advice to them, which was nothing to do with, with litigation work, or sometimes to, to, to write, mm -hmm. uh, to write documents, opinions, opinions and, yeah. contracts. So from the very, very early stage of my career, I did both. When most of the, the, the barristers who were starting like me were, were only doing litigation. And I've always tried to balance both. And I, I no, I can't. I you won't. got choose. Okay, that's, I think that's fair enough. One, one last question though on the litigation part. Do you have a style? How, how would you describe yourself as a litigator? Because you have the gentleman lit litigator, you have the aggressive litigator. How would you describe your style? Certainly more <laughs> gentleman than aggressive. <laughs> uh, I, I, I've often tried to oppose my, my, my friends on the other side uh, by saying, by telling them, stop being uh, your, your Gestapo style of questioning. Because I think, especially in Mauritius, many things that when you are, you are brutal with the witness, obviously the witness is scared sometimes, but you, you want somebody who is scared get, gets mute usually. Exactly. So I think uh, this is the wrong approach. However, and usually you get more by bringing the person on your side and trying to say and trying to astutely yeah. get get uh, unfold what should be uh, unfolded. However, at times a little <laughs> <laughs> a little punch <laughs> a little punch <laughs> helps as well. Uh, helps. Yeah. Okay, good. That might be a difficult one because you have so many decades of experience. But your most memorable case. My first one, maybe? Okay. No, it's memorable because I remember it. <laughs> when I finished and I was called to the bar, mm -hmm. and I, I was on holiday here, and then I went to France to do a degree. And during my vacation, a, 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 an attorney said, do you want to take a, a case before you go? Okay. And I said, obviously, I was very excited without much preparation. I remember it was a commercial case, and there was, as you know, the rule mm -hmm. in the civil code, you need a writing to prove a contract, with the exception of commercial law, with some of those exceptions. And there is a way around it, mm -hmm. personal answers, mm -hmm. interrogatoire sur fait et article. And this was all about it, and obviously this is alien to English law. Of course. Yeah, quite severe. <laughs> I, I, I never heard of... And you trained in England. In England. <laughs> so the, the only way to prove the, 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 this agreement, this contract, was to call him on his personal answers first, not on the oath. So, but I, 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 I mean, I really, they, they just explained to me. On my side, there were a lot of people, and not was were for me and I in fact on the other side my opponent was also for me <laughs> and he was Mark David and it was Sir Mark right. David and I remember putting the questions I, I, I mean I was going out I don't don't even know where I was going to what I needed to achieve you were what like 25 yes I was 25 before I went so yes probably 25 20. 24 because I went and came back uh, 26. 20. So the profession was small. It was in the intermediate court. And I think the jurisdiction then was 10,000 rupees. So it was a case of about 8,000 rupees. And uh, I, I, so I called the defendant on his personal answers. And I remember 
Then I said, to, I turned around to the, the, those who were next to me and I said, it's over. And they told me, no, the essential question you haven't asked. <laughs> and I said, what is it? <laughs> so I, 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 I asked the essential question. I remember, the, so we won the case, but I remember that Mark David <laughs> wanted me to win the case. <laughs> That's he really funny. wanted. This That's was funny. this was maybe, maybe the another case is not um, so much the word. Maybe ca cases or affair, which obviously drain me the most, and equivocally, it's it, it's it's a criminal case. Not one only criminal because it had a lot of incidental civil matters. It's the famous case which is at the assizes now. The case of Megro, mm. of the, the murder of, of Vanessa Largesse. And I think mm. this is a case where I was involved, was so much implicated in this case. You, you don't remember it at all, maybe. No. no. I mean, I read about it now, you know, 30 but, years uh, later. But in a nutshell, later, but, and yeah. I'm, but in a nutshell, it happened that I was the, uh, the lawyer of Bernard Megro, of his wife. And then by concours de circonstance, I also had to assist Maurice Toste, who was also arrested. When I was assisting Megro Bernard, I was myself arrested. This lasted a lot of time. It obviously drained mm, me a lot. That went over many, many years. It had an, a lot of incidental civil application. I even had to go to, to uh, because Bernard Megro had uh, made a claim in France against a famous French uh, hebdomadaire, Le Nouvel Observateur. I was a, a witness in, in, in that case. I had to, to testify. And he won his uh, defamation case. So, I mean, this is probably the, uh, the case of the matter which obviously have numerous yeah. incidental branches, if I may say so. I don't know if it's the right term, which obviously, uh, which for me, I mean, I, stuck I with you the most. Stuck with yeah. me the most. And, yeah. and, and uh, it's incredible that 23 years I know. down I mean, the road, I'm reading we're, about we're, it we're, now, we're, I think, we're, we're yeah. still, yeah. it's still of actuality. It's still live. Did, did, have you ever felt at any point, you know, you did say that you, you know, the job still excites you. But have you ever felt at any point, I've had enough of this, I'm, I'm giving up now. I'm, Fortunately I'm not. Really? Well, That's wonderful. Yeah, That's I wonderful. Know. Do you truly feel that, yes, you were, you know, you grew up in a legal environment and you kind of intuitively went into it, you enjoy your job. Do you feel that this is my purpose? Being a lawyer is not your purpose in life, but you, this is the career I've, I've always meant to have and I've, this is the right uh, career for me. I think at the very, very outset of our conversation, I said I was not going mm. to, I never thought of doing it. But now with hindsight, I think, yes, I mean, but I could have done other things. Yes, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. We have a lot of, as you, you commented earlier, there are a lot of lawyers now over a thousand barristers and a lot of the things that we hear from the young ones coming in because of the sheer number and the complexity of the world that we, we navigate in is that they find it really hard. They find it hard to make a name. Maybe it's something to do with a bit of impatience as well. We were talking about impatience earlier. They struggle to find good quality work. They struggle. They want to try it out as a sole practitioner, but they find it very hard. They don't think that they get the mentorship that they are necessarily look, looking for, rightly or wrongly, thinking this. What advice would you have for, for a young 27-year-old, freshly called to the bar, who is struggling and who is wondering whether they made the right choice? The, the first thing, obviously, he, he should try to get uh, in a set of chambers, if possible, if there are avenues. Obviously, this is not quite easy, or in a, in a law firm, and there are more law firms now, and I think there are scopes in both. 
but it's not an easy because of sheer number of newcomers at the bar. If they don't get it, I think a, a couple of years at, uh, in a, as an in-house is something which would help. At least you earn your living decently. The avenue of the state law office is it's a very, very good school. Even if you don't want to end there, your career there, but it's a very good starting point for your career as a barrister. But if all of these avenues are not open to you, I think the only way to do is to try to attract work. You must obviously have work, but to get, but when you have one case, do your utmost. Mm. Don't uh, hesitate to go and see a senior to help you. But on this particular case, do your utmost. You need hard work, you need to be thorough, and you need to do your best. And I'm sure even if the case is not won at the end, gradually you will be known as somebody who is professional, who is serious, and you will attract work. And obviously, I think politeness among the brotherhood of lawyers is essential. Mm. I mean, I, I, I hear a lot of people say that the new ones, they don't uh, sometimes they have no manners. And I'm not quite, I don't know, with me personally, I don't feel this, I must say. And usually on the, on the contrary, some, sometimes they walk to me and they say, hi, how are you? Or they introduce themselves. But this is a bit of a recurrent mm. criticism I hear sometimes. But uh, if that is so, but you, you've got to be uh, polite. And humble as well, perhaps. And humble as well, mm. obviously. Mm. Obviously, we, we've got a tendency to, today to, to, to have uh, going towards the commercialization of the profession which is something I don't like because then you lose your, your sense of, of justice and of, of, of trying to assist, of fairness, and you go and profit becomes the main reason why, the you, main do reason it, yeah. why you, you are doing your job. Mm. I know you need to, to live and earn your living and, and you can be tempted to go on the radio, on the media, on the television, and try to publicize yourself. But uh, I would say, I mean, as far as my ADN is concerned, I think this is totally against my, my principle. And I, I, I would hate, I, I, I do hate the American way. Of very brash, very brash loud. And, then, and... and sometimes even putting ads on, on television. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't like it. And I think uh, the British, the Anglo-Saxon are still confined within the limits which we should be confined. And sometimes I'm scary when I see on the continent, the European continent, let's say the French lawyers sometimes going public and I'm a bit uneasy. There is a tendency in some jurisdiction to go more and more public and to voice your own feeling. And this is dangerous. You're not supposed to, not really supposed to voice your personal opinion on, on particularly in... Strictly speaking, yeah, yes. On, on but, cases, uh, on when we, yeah. when we see on television, I'm now talking, I'm not a, the Americans who do it all, all sure, the time. Sure. The British, the English do it, not less, but almost, they, they don't do it usually. They're not allowed to, I suppose. But sometimes we, we are exposed to the French system and sometimes I see that, I, as far as I'm concerned, they go overboard mm. and they, they, they go too far. Some of them, not all of them. And we, we, I, I, I should advise our young bar not to, to, to avoid, but I, I, but I can see that many, many, many try to go and, and, and intervene on television and and sometimes not in a very sober way. Mm, I, I understand what you mean. And, and 
Is that one of the things, therefore, that because that was going to be my next question, if there was one thing, given the, the state of the profession today, that you would change, what, what would it be? I'm not talking about the judiciary, I'm talking about the profession, the legal profession. What would it be? If there's one, if you had a magic wand and you could change one thing. You're not talking about the, 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 the judicial system, you're talking about the, the profession itself. Yeah, yeah. The... I mean, well, I mean, there's a serious need to have a stronger bar, a more organized bar. We've, we've improved, huh? Mm, mm. I, I, was, I, I was the chairman of a bar at one stage quite a long Were time you? back. Okay. Yes, yeah, so 2009, I think, okay. eight, nine, okay. 2008, nine. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have a seat. We didn't have a seat. Really? And everything we were organizing was by, by your own means. I didn't have a secretary. I u was using my, my own secretary. We didn't have archives. So much so that when I was the current chairman, I got letters from the president or the president, president chairman two years back from somebody mm -hmm. saying, we've written complaining about the conduct of a barrister and we haven't heard anything about it. So things got lost. Yeah. And you didn't I, have a secretary. Um. And, and there was no, I mean, then I, I, I had to go back to the, 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 the chairman in function then, and very often he wouldn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you realize you are a member of the public, wrongly or rightly, you had complained about a barrister, a particular barrister on a particular case, and you didn't have any response to that. It doesn't so, inspire trust and faith in the profession. Obviously, yeah. it, it doesn't. Mm. But we know that the, the, the majority of these complaints are, more, are yeah, uh, un, un, unfounded, curious, usually. Yeah. Yeah? Mm. Because when I was a president for that year, we got a lot. Really? And I had, in fact, I, what I had done is I had on a committee, because it was too many complaints, I had, I had a, a committee of elders just to look at the complaints. Just to look at them, to filter the complaints. Wow. And when they, they thought there was substance, then we would discuss it. But at least to have a system where you had to reply. Mm. Say, mm. We, we've taken note, we have acknowledged, but we think there's no, sure. at least do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. But fortunately, hardly a year after me, because, like, I would say, because of, of all the, of what he did, Amit Mulan, mm. we got the seat where it is now. Yeah, and, uh, I didn't and realize that, was... <laughs> that didn't have a seat before. No, we wow. didn't have, and we got wow. seat, which is a beauty, but unfortunately not efficiently used. Because I think, again, that the member of the professions, they, they don't care. Most of them don't. Because when I was there, we had a restaurant there. And really? Yes, we had a restaurant. Wow. Uh, we, we, uh, but after the first restaurant we had, after three months, but they said, okay, we're losing so much money. <laughs> <laughs> is it because, because no one was going or is it because nobody it was, was going? Mm -hmm. No, no, nobody was going. I mean, I often try to, you can often try to boost, to boost people. I, I bring friends or members of my chambers. Sometimes we get some number. In those days, obviously, t today you have television everywhere. You have got your iPhone. You can do look at all the news you want. But in those days, this was uh, less we were less exposed and we had a television breaking news from the BBC online, let's say all these LCI or whatever, but we, we could, and th that should have been a motivation to come yeah. and, have, and have your lunch there and to, or to take a coffee. Mm -hmm. It did work. We then had another provider or a, a, a restaurant provider, but it lasted a few months again. We, I think we even had a third one when I was no longer, because I was still trying to organize. Mm. And so to answer your question, I think the bar association, the bar council, in spite of it, they're, they're doing their best, they're doing their utmost, mm. but uh, we need to do much more. Mm. To, and to encourage more that collegiality that, um, yes. that, that should exist. I know that in England, I mean, I'm quite sure because I remember my counterpart in England, I, I, I forgot his name, but I met him. I went to see him in High Hoburn where their seat is. I forgot his name now. 
But I think he almost took a year off. Obviously, you must get the means to do it. And he was not working so much. So he was almost, although it was not, he was not remunerated for that, but he was doing this almost full time. In France, my counterpart, I remember now him, I remember his name, Charlier Bournazel. And he, he continued with his practice because he was a small practice, almost a sole practitioner. And, but he went, he was a hard worker, he went to his chambers, his cabinet, let's say up to 8.30 in the morning, from 6.30 to 8.30. Then he was full time at the, the Palais, at La Maison de l'Avocat. But he had, he had some logistics with him. He had a chauffeur, he had a car. Obviously, they've got means there. It's a big, big bar. He was not remunerated, as far as I know, but obviously, probably, his uh, expenses were catered for. But he, then he came back at six at night, and he was working up to eight to be able to continue. Of course. So, I mean, maybe if we do that, we won't get anybody. But still, because we've got a small jurisdiction, we're different. But still, we must rethink about the organization of the Bar Council mm. and more broadly about the, the association with more powers. I think this has been a recurrent discussion, but uh, I think, and I suggest that this should be the, uh, our focus in the future for the, for the barristers. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's a... It's a great, grand inspiration, and I think it's, it's the right one. Last question for you, Patrice. You've been a senior counsel for a while now. How does it feel to be a senior counsel? Does it feel any different, or you just feel the same person, except that you... How did it feel when, when you obtained the... C'est un prestige, quand même, when you got the title for you? You're just doing your job, and it's just a recognition of all those years of hard work, does it mean something to you personally? I must be very careful because okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to, as, as we said, crash it on soup. Okay. I really think the system should be differently organized now. Obviously, when you tell me whether I was happy, obviously I was happy when Chief Justice called me, Bernard Sikren, and asked me whether I accepted, and if I hadn't been called, I would have been most probably <laughs> unhappy. Uh, however, two things. I think uh, that we must be very careful because, I mean, I, I don't, I think it can be a prestige, you call it elevated to the status of, that's the word they use in England at least, but at the same time, it must not give us a feeling of having two bars. And they call it upper, inner, whatever. And I think this is dangerous. Dangerous, because we, we're all on the same level. And we should be. And I've seen sometimes some of my colleagues, and I think this is as if in a court where there is no courtroom, where there is no space, almost taking to task a junior would be on the same bench, uh, bench uh, uh, as you are, uh, in the front. And I think this is unacceptable. No. What? Uh, you, 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 Suddenly no, you're not a human being anymore. No, you're not a human being. Yeah. There, no, there shouldn't be two categories of barristers. We are all the same categories, the same power, the same rights, the same right of audience. OK, there's a recognition for your professionalism, this might be a good thing, if it enhances the other barristers to try to, to improve. This, I think, is a good thing. But to, to make two types of barristers, because I know people right now, especially that the, the, in Mauritius, it's not done on a regular basis. Sure. And uh, therefore, there are a lot of our friends that are frustrated, frustrated and yeah. that yeah. who deserves to be. Mm. And I think that we are on, in a profession now of over 1,000, as we said, and I don't even know practicing senior counsel. 
15, maybe, which is... Proportionately, me, that doesn't make sense. Doesn't yeah. make sense. Mm. So, and, and the, the second point, I, I, I really think, and I wrote about it once or twice, I think uh, the days where, when it was done on a, you know, contact basis, things like that, it's a bit difficult to, uh, that it continues. I know it worked. It worked rather well. But uh, at the same time, I think now there should be more objective criteria. I don't say that we go as far as they do in England. Where you have to apply. Where you, you have, have to, to apply, yeah. then almost you, you, you've got to pass an exam. Yeah, showcase all your cases, your favorite cases and all of that. Exactly. You know, and yeah. this is, no, too much. I mean, this is too much. And, we, and I don't like it, by the way. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think that it should be a little bit different. I think they, they've improved. I remember after being a senior counsel, the, uh, the Chief Justice, when he wanted to do this, uh, this exercise, and you all was a, a, another Chief Justice, he asked us, Senior Counsel... Your thoughts. Your, our thoughts. And uh, I think we, uh, we did it once or twice, at least twice or three times. I think that was a good thing. At least it was not just among the, the judiciary on their own. It, it, it was uh, enlarging a little bit the the scope of, of trying to see who could deserve to be or not. But you can understand also that if you limit it to only this, then one or two will push of course. people rather than others. And then also this is not quite, quite right. It's difficult. It's difficult to get the best system. But I think the old system must evolve. Thank you but not go as far as some as other jurisdiction. <laughs> Thank you, Patrice. Thank you for your candor, your humility especially. I really look up to you, so thank you for coming here today. Thank you for <laughs> making me think that I'm in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.